Except for Brian. He's too tall for the front row. <laughs> Sadie, that's your spot right there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to the Center of Photography at Woodstock um, for our weekly Meet the Artists. We've had a couple weeks off, so it's really nice to be back here and have a nice crowd. Um, if you don't already know CPW, we are a museum and school, and uh, we have a beautiful new building down the street where we'll be hosting these and many other events and exhibitions uh, starting next fall. So please keep an eye on, on what we've got going on. It's very exciting. Uh, tonight we're joined by Raymond Meeks, which we're very excited uh, to be hosting. Um, Raymond Meeks has been recognized for his books and pictures centered on memory and place, the way in which a landscape can shape an individual, and in the abstract, how a place possesses you in its absence. His books have been described as a field or a vertical plane for examining interior coexistences as life moves in circles and moments and events, often years apart, unravel and overlap, informing new meetings. Can ask Ray what that means later. Raymond Meeks lives and works in the Hudson Valley. Uh, his work is represented in numerous private and public collections. He's the sixth laureate of immersion, a French American photography commission sponsored by Fondation d'Enterprise Hermes. Uh, exhibitions from his commission are scheduled for New York, ICP September 2023, which is now. How how long is it up? January 8th. Great. So yeah. get down to the city. It's a wonderful show. We watched him work on it over at our building. Uh, and Paris uh, at the Foundation uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, in September next year. The Inhabitants, a book made in collaboration with writer George Weld, will be published in August 2023 by Mac. We're fast-forwarding. That's now... That's I believe Ray may have some books with him, so if you can get a hang on one of those, I, I recommend it. Ray Meeks is a 2020 recipient of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in Photography and was awarded a Paulette Krasner Foundation grant in 2022. We're very excited to welcome Ray here. Thank you. I'm just glad there are two dogs running around tonight. That's the best part. Well, I'm, I'm going to actually start with, I was, uh, actually, Sarah called me yesterday and said, Ray, we've, <laughs> we need to, we need you to, to step up uh, for tonight. And uh, I was happy to, to give it a go. Um, I just got back from some, doing some of this in Europe. So I felt like I was primed for this, but now I'm up here. I'm not so sure I'm primed for this, but, um, but I was thinking about, <clears throat> is that good? Okay. You all can hear me. Um, I was I was thinking last year I was I was at uh, I was at Perry Photo in France um, having dinner with some friends and uh, just having a good time having drinks and light conversation and all of a sudden out of nowhere a friend a friend addressed the whole table and said uh, has photography saved your life <laughs> I was like there's no segue to that question but it was like has photography saved your life? And we all kind of went around talking about the ways photography has saved our lives. And I mean, they're, you know, like esteemed colleagues uh, around me and people I just thought like had it all together and they all had ways that photography saved their life. And I got to thinking about like for myself, um, the way that photography, the, the camera as an instrument, um, I don't know if it saved my life. Funny, like one of the photographers was Tim Carpenter who wrote a book called To Photograph is to Learn How to Die. So I'm thinking like, oh, we're 50. We're all thinking about these existential things. But but I, I think <clears throat> photography for me and the, the use of a camera has been like, I'm like an animal with like armed with a sonar. So like I'm with my camera, with my instrument, I'm seeing the world, I'm projecting the world. I'm, I'm making an image. The image comes to me, I'm making, I'm, I'm editing that work, I'm making a print, sending that back out in the world and this call and response that happens between what's happening inside of me and the calibration and what's happening inside of me and what's happening in the outside world starts to inform my own sense. Like for whatever reason, I don't, I didn't, I feel like I lacked a form. I feel like I, I lacked an understanding of my identity or my essence. Um, 
or my the shape, like all those things for some reason or another, we'll call it like lack of love, um, small thing. Like the camera, the use of the camera and the use of the camera to understand the world, understand by way of these things that I'm making, books and pictures and the way people are receiving them, this coming back to me starts to give shape to who I am. It starts to give me a sense of my own form. I think that's something that that most of us, I think that's a common characteristic of, uh, characteristic of most people. I'll say that with some confidence that we, we lack a sense of our, of our own identity. And uh, just 30 years of doing this, it started over time, it starts to compound and you start to get this sense of, I start to get the sense of who I am, what my contribution might be, how I might be useful, you know, why I'm interested, like all these questions still linger, but in, in search of these questions, like I'm starting to understand my own identity. Um, so anyways, I thought that was kind of an interesting place to start. I have three um, bodies of work that I will show that are organized by way of books. Um, the first book is Half Story, Half Life, um, Supreme Honey Cathedral. And then I'm going to touch briefly on the last book, which is the most recent book, The Inhabitants, um, because George and I, I think are going to do a conversation. George is the writer for The Inhabitants. We'll do a conversation uh, probably in January, February. So I see you all looking at the screen like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on with the picture. So. Um, I, uh, I am a photographer who does not photograph towards a known subject. Uh, and by that, what I mean is I don't decide, like, I'm going to go photograph the border wall. You know, I, I don't work towards any sort of social political ambition. I make pictures in direct response to the place I am, uh, the place I've been set down and try to well mostly i'm using that because that becomes my constraint that becomes the place that i can make try to make sense of and try to understand and try to love or learn to love um it becomes the place where i project where i'm doing an inner projection onto the outside world and getting something back in, in return that helps me understand who i am where i am who are these people that are orbiting my life these pictures that you're looking at now are comp it's, it's a combination of pictures of Adriana Alt, who's been my partner for the last 10 years in her home, a single mother, um, and then pictures of the outside world. This will eventually become part of a body of work um, titled Cyprian Honey Cathedral. But all of the, these these pictures are are pretty much centered within five miles of my home or in my immediate home or in my partner's home. Um, I tend to be a photographer. I think of myself as a photographer who is more of like a, a, well, a dog stake to a tree is how I think of it, where I just tend to orbit. And I tend to want to go on more of the vertical plane. I'm, I'm interested in, in entering through as narrow portal as possible and diving down as opposed to being on the more horizontal plane. A lot of photographers go out into the world and they go out and they make pictures, they bring them back. My, <laughs> my orbit tends to be relatively small and, I, and I'm always striving to make it smaller because I believe in, for me, in going down and diving down. Um, I think of it kind of as like an hourglass where like going down, diving down, you go through this small opening and then it opens up into something bigger and more existential. Um, so these pictures are all of uh, Adriana, my partner, single mother, just just doing what she does, you know, just loving the way she uses her body in a particular way. Um, these are landscapes that have been been made all over, but you know, this is well, actually, these are all again within like five miles of my home. Um, I started to photograph Adriana, my partner, um, about 10 years ago when we were getting ready to move homes, change homes. And um, I had done previous work on domestic, uh, centered on domesticity. And um, I have some notes that I'm going to read while, while we're looking at pictures. I'm going to try not to speak too much. 
but these, what I'm reading are notes that I use to, to help me um, just sort of start to understand the work, start to put some stakes in the ground, start to build constraints so I can, so I can start to center and more tightly organize the world that I, that I wish to focus on. And in this case, it is specifically the way Adriana uses her body, the way she uses her, the way she gestures, like the particular, her idiosyncrasies, and also those of the place that I live. Uh oh, good, temperamental. Our ability to measure and apportion time as a source of comfort walls to contain our possessions and keep out that which we fear, faint discordances in the shady corner of the backyard, Sunday evening sadness. We're all bound up in a web of lo love and loss. We're naturally more interested in those private lives that are not publicly exhibited. This is just a large board of pictures that I'm, as I'm making work, I'm starting to make prints and put images up to consider them. I generally like, this is a hard way for me to look at pictures. Um, I tend to, when I have this many pictures, I, it becomes one picture for me. So I tend to have to work with single pictures in a stack that I can shuffle and move around. And um, I also, when pictures are lined up like this, like I rely so much on chance in the editing process of two images finding themselves next to each other and then coming to the realization that these are doing something together that they wouldn't do on their own. And that happens um, just by chance or happenstance. And it doesn't happen when they're pinned to a, to a wall or to a board for me. And so here I'm starting, this is, I did a portfolio for Stanley Barker that was called um, Seven Kinds of Loneliness. And I'm starting to play with these diptychs that um, one of the images throughout the series will be a, a a portrait of Adriana in the early mornings um, before she woke or when she woke and then went back to sleep, which was more often the case. Um, and I was photographing her at that time because I was recognizing that at that time, I felt like we were as close to the essence of who we were before. Like there's an erasure that happens as we sleep and the information, the data, the experiences that we don't need are essentially erased. And then we wake in the morning and I felt like every morning I experienced her and she was probably experiencing me close to the essence of who, who we were. And then we wake, we have coffee and we start repopulating our identity with, with these things that we do. Um, sorry, Sarah, I'm not sure what I'm, maybe I'm talking to. Okay. Um, so, you know, housewife, mother, father, provider, soccer coach, all these things, all these identities start to then accumulate again and take over the essence of who we are. And I was curious was curious about that to photograph her and then pairing them with, with, um, with what's happening in our like subconscious and then conscious above the ground and then during sleep when we're below uh, consciousness. Houses are full of drama, shelter where you look out at the, you look out the window and see the world a house where you'll die, a house where you'll get divorced, a house is where you'll have your most sacred and profound experiences. And all of this work now is starting after like two or three years um, to become a book that will be published by Mac in 2020, titled Cyprian Honey Cathedral. The title uh, came, well, I was out photographing um, near Cairo, New York, on the other side of the river. And a family had vacated a house. Their possessions were at the end of a driveway. And they'd been in the rain. And the, the laminates were starting to peel off the furniture. On the back of this child's dresser, written upside down in black crayon, was Cyprian Honey Cathedral, just in three lines. Um, Cyprian, not spelled the way that Cyprian would be C-Y-P-R-A-N, I think. Didn't understand it wrote it down, made it, made a few pictures with it, and then sort of filed it away. And then came time for the title of the book, and it just seemed obvious like that was the title of the book. Um, it doesn't speak of anything in particular, but somehow it captures the essence, I think, of 
the work in a in a ambiguous, obscure way. It's lack that gives us inspiration. We don't create out of fullness. That's from Ray Bradbury. Art comforts the disturb and disturbs the comfortable. The body as an instrument of joy, sanity, self-love. And then like as an ambition for this project, I wrote at one point in my journal, the tenuous balance between ruin and splendor. This, in many of these cases, these are the sequences that appeared in the book. And so the stacking of images also, um, the lower picture in, in these diptychs, I guess not here, but most often, um, is to represent sort of like a, a baseline also, so sort of um, to lay down a foundation of images in which it's a constant, Adriana in repose, in 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 sleep, a state of, uh, of sleep, and then the world above. Um, that represents uncertainty, chaos, uh, ruin and splendor. Um, and so playing with those two, the one constant and then the one that can move in and out, similar to probably music, um, jazz, but also um, trying to think of the writer, uh, not Virginia Woolf, um, British writer, um, she used, I can't think of her name, sorry. Um, she composed, would compose poems in two parts. Um, one part that would would be a continuous story and then one part that would be uh, vignettes of, of pieces of, of stories and profiles of text. And she wove those two things together. So it also references that in some way. Forgive me for not being able to remember the, who's a British? Emily Dickinson, thank you. Is she American? Okay, maybe that's why I'm... Aesthetic objects are useful in that they best may be the only way to make unique maps of ourselves, to get us achingly close to the ineffable and to communicate our tentative findings to others. Phenomena of place, not the thing itself, but the effect of it, the effect of this kind of living, Inter interested in things that have been marginalized because they reminded us of our mortality, obscene, off the scene, observed, but never spoken about. That's from Lewis Boltz. That life's actually about a lot of spillage that we're trying to hide from ourselves and from other people. In, in the the editing and the sequencing of this work, I you know I found myself trying to ward against sentimentality and nostalgia, um, and then just by chance I looked up the word nostalgia and found that the Greek from the Greek the word uh, nostos is to return home, and algos uh, is a pain or an ache, um, which allowed me to embrace both nostalgia and sentimentality on some level. The way to be truly universal is to be particular, moment by moment, detail by detail, the vital expression of the inexpressible. There was, um, at the, in the cover on the back, this piece of text on the book itself um, begins on the back cover. Um, and I composed this piece of text as a text collage that was meant to essentially serve as what a portrait might serve on the front of a book. Um, and in this piece of free associative text, um, I called it a, a ditty, I think, 
um, I try to accumulate and compose um, word references of, of place, of, of vernacular that was particular to Adriana, who was born in, in, New, or in New Orleans, uh, in Louisiana, um, events that had happened in the home. Uh, and so this piece um, that I wrote as a free associative uh, reads, Elastic Winter, Dark Bird Barreling Down, Damp, uh, dust in the air, damp dust on tongue, dry hours, rising, falling, joy torn stitches, memory rich, memory healed, awoken, tumbling house broken, child scribbled, wall stained manual, too small to read. This is a moment, this is exactly what she's born to be. Off key curve of soap, distant eggs turning, burnt honey, bad news barbecue sauce. Don't let's go down the hall, and to, down the hall and to the stairs, down the stairs and into the water. Gray current, silk road, pregnant shadows, cross ceiling, shadows across treetops, shadows crossing sky. Cold egg broken with a fork, tender fern stri striped mattress, portable heater, heater, merry widow sugar boo, full tilt boogie, blackbird barreling down, stray keys, salvation, too small to read. Trees with pasted on leaves, mother of all questions, fistful of flowers, giant simple face of sea. And this is what she does, and this is what she's meant to be and this is what she is and this is what she does the last part is from um it's from a nick cave song rings of saturn um i want to invite you all to at any point stop me and ask questions as they come up as opposed to waiting towards the end if you have a question technical or aesthetic or whatever it might be please please uh, ask and so the next body of work, this is actually out of order. Um, Half Story, Half Life was from, published um, by Chose Commune in 2018. Um, this work was made uh, near Cairo, Durham, um, in the Catskills. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and show some pictures. This was the question. Yeah. Uh, what medium do you prefer, or what, with what medium do you work? What I'm asking is, uh, the most pictures are black and white, uh -huh. and some are in color. And I wanted to know, is there a logic or a decision when to do what or the other? Mm -hmm. and because if it were digital, you will always have both. Right. So is it digital or is it analog film? It's both. <laughs> it's both it's both and all um and so how do you decide when to do what yeah well when it's when it's a digital file it it does come up as color and so i don't i photograph even when i photograph photographing digital my my camera is set to view things in black and white um in black and white i view in black and white yeah, yeah. so i'm thinking about form I'm thinking about, I'm thinking primarily about form. Um, I'm thinking more about line and texture. Um, I don't like to look through the viewfinder. Just like it's, I liked working with a, with a view camera actually, because I'm not seeing everything. I'm seeing what, what's in focus. I'm seeing what's on the edges. Cause I like to work from the edges in. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't want to see everything. I want to be surprised by what I see later. And I'm thinking more about I'm thinking more about form than I am about color. Um, so. Oh, maybe the question, I should ask that question later, or I should give anybody else the chance to ask the question. You want to ask? I'll wait. <laughs> OK. Wait. All right, so, so yeah. One more question. What is the life of your pictures? What is the manifestation of the how do they come into being? Is it in the book? Is it in a print? Or mm -hmm. How do the pictures manifest themselves? Um, that's a that's a, a good question that I could answer in a number of different ways. I mean, the way I prefer to see it, the way I prefer just about anything in book form, um, and I photograph with the book form in mind, um, primarily because I'm relying on serial imagery. I'm I'm, I'm relying on the accumulation of images. And I'm relying on uh, what is possible between two pictures that are lined next to each other. That they, you know, what a picture can't do on its own, um, in the context of another picture placed next to it, it can do something completely different. You know, like 
a lot of these, some of these pictures aren't lined up in the book the same way, but uh, like this picture, these are two pictures that came together for me in the editing process by accident. And they do something together that neither one of them would do as well on their own. And, and I like <clears throat> relying on that. I also think that the book form has the potential to renew an image or a body of work. Um, for me, like to make a picture and make a print in the dark room and put it on the wall, to me, like that thing begins to die almost immediately, or I begin to lose, I begin to lose. It, it doesn't have the potential to continue uh, evolving. It becomes sort of this fixed thing for me. And if it's in a book and it's in relation with other pictures, then that single picture can take on different meaning by way of relationship with other images and us coming to the book as different human beings, you know, uh, a year later or a month later or a week later, even sometimes you start to see things that are being, that are, that are being imposed by other images around it. So the in-between is more important than the single image? Uh, very much so. Yes. And sometimes that in-between is space. It's like, it's no image or it's an image that, I mean, you'll see pictures here in this, this body of work that aren't doing a lot of work except, except providing space, providing space for the imagination, for the viewer to complete the picture or complete a picture. So I'm inviting, I'm hoping that with my pictures, I'm inviting the viewer to bring their own imagination and complete images. So, I mean, we used to deal in books that were monographs and the monograph would be the best, the greatest hits the photographer had to offer, an artist had to offer. Now we're working in a book form where that's not the ambition, that's not the goal of the work for me. And I, I, I very rarely want to look at an, a single image, it, you know. It, what you're saying now helps me a lot in an approach to understanding the image. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm baffled by the, uh, how do you say that, the plurality of, of, of things. Yeah. And I, and I can't, uh, how do you say that? I can't rationalize how you do it or what is your driving force. And, mm -hmm. and now, so I'm, I'm... The driving force is resonance. The driving force is, is images together. Certain images together create a different energy. They, they vibrate. They like, you know, and if, you, if I can reason it, if I can say like, oh, these two images work together because this thing is doing that. They're, if I can reason it, then you can reason it. And once you reason it, it's like a riddle. Once you know the riddle, it's like, you know, I get it. That's very nice. Yes. Yeah. So if I can reason it or if I can, it has to, it has to resonate in a way that defies words. That's ineffable to me. Um, yeah. So, Thank you. yeah, that was a great, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, so this body of work, Half Story, Half Life, I, this is photographed uh, at a place called Furlong in the Catskills. It's a, it's a, there are these cliffs that uh, are 30, 40, 50 feet high over a pond and, and teenagers and young college students have been coming there for centuries or for a century at least um, to jump from the cliffs there. And uh, I was drawn there just by accident. Somebody said this place exists and I went there and the light alone in these bodies surrounded in the backdrop of what seemed to be paradise to me with light coming in from above, uh, illuminating their bodies um, really was enough for me. And we'll get to those pictures soon. This, these, these, this is a sequence from the book. And in this sequence, I'm trying to set these jumpers, these young, young, mostly men, men and women, um, I'm trying to set it in a place, and this place is rural America, rural upstate New York. Um, the first, one of the first lines that sort of sets the tone for this body of work was from C.D. Wright. If you could just say, I feel lost here and I'm going home, for where on earth would you buy that ticket? Who would meet you when you got there? By what sign would they know you? So this is, you know, these early pictures for me are, 
my hope is that they'll set sort of a psychic emotional space for the work. Yeah. So you talked about like not necessarily working with the subject. And I feel like that kind of takes a certain confidence to do. Was that something that you was inherent to your work from the beginning, not working necessarily reliant on subject or was that something that developed out of just a like, long practice? Yeah, it developed out of a, because a content again is like, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to make work that's content or subject based and not work towards uh, a theory or not work towards, I work towards questions, but I don't work towards an idea, you know, and it's, I think it's hard to take on a subject based project. I don't like to take on a project at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but it's hard to take that on and not have it be about, like I try to avoid aboutness, like I, with my work, I don't want any, like even this body of work to close down around a subject, you know, it sort of it it takes the life out of it. It is both, but I but I don't you know like if this were a book about jumpers, like that's you know I have pictures of jumpers that are, uh, m you know m more like Siskin's uh, uh, you know bodies in 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 the air that are more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for that are. The form is per is a more perfect form. These are these are pictures of failings. You know these are so a lot of that happens in the editing process. I think I just talked around that question. <laughs> um, I'll just read some again some sort of outlining notes for this this body of work. The whole American idea of masculinity, the whole infantile idea, to be a man is is much more various than the American myth would have it. It's signaled by the depth to, to extent of extent to which you can accept the dangers and power and beauty of love. Shared space and joined experience, a contemplation of what it is to be young and male in a small corner of rural America. The common elements that glue us together, friendships, bounding ability to hold and tack our emotions and our graceless moments together, a solace that can only be found in proximity to one another. I've come to experience the activities at Furlong as nearly sacramental, stone altar, bodies rising as an offering. We shelter our boys from the world's transgressions until a certain age of adolescence where they begin to conspire with other young men in this ritual of becoming a man. We then heft the weight of our ills, prepare them for battle, for fatherhood, etc. A communicated sense of stillness infused with vibrancy a quality I find in much of the art I love, that I'm being restored, set upright, reminded of a frequency I need to tune myself to. Less exalted gestures of balance against gravity, more failure, accident, mistake. So the piece of um, the I, I also I also composed a uh, a text collage for this body of work that again draws on the atmosphere of place, uh, overheard conversations, uh, interviews with musicians, Bruce Springsteen, just like merging all this together as single elements that I then compose into a text collage. I'll go ahead and read it while we're looking at pictures. Natural born acne faced prophecy drawn from limestone altar, send it falling like wet leaves marking time, advent vapors give rise to prayer. I hope you make it in the Genesis pipe dream, dripping temples of life, mystery of my little hometown, make America great again, wonderful lies being whispered in damp ears, running mascara, snap of bras popping, tortured by soft skin, lint blue bald walk home. Tragic unknowability of women hit me and felt like a kiss, moment of unwoven bliss. Three-second orgasm, one Mississippi, two. Silent gods of Olympus, we got to get out of this place. Three Mississippi, four. Catskill, chill, scorched, burning-ass truth emanating from sweat. Would you take another chance on me? Goodbye to you. I hope you make it.
What would the subject be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it can be a subject. I mean, I just wouldn't want it to only be a subject. You know, I mean, for me, I had to approach it as my own investigation of masculinity. Um, and that wasn't something that I came to until either three years or four years into the project or even afterwards when the book was made and you put something out into the world. And, you know, for me, I don't quite yet know what the work is about, you know, but that becomes more clear when people start to respond back to you, oh, this work tells me is, is about this or this work. I'm relating to this work because I had a similar experience growing up or, but for me, it was like strictly about like, I've always been mesmerized by watching a group of men. And I grew up playing football, uh, but I also grew up surrounded by women and, you know, aunts and grandmothers and like Italian, like just surrounded by women and uh, my sisters, I had two sisters on both sides. So so, and I had a, you know, best friend and all that. And, but like, but masculinity and, 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 uh, chauvinism, like those things were foreign to me, like playing football, we, you know, in the huddle it would just be like, these guttural sounds would come out of everyone around me. And I was just like, just run the play. Like I was just, it was like hysterical to me. It was, it was comical, you know? And so just trying, and then like going here and seeing these young men, you know, like, you know, daring each other and like it's it, part of it is this coming of age is you know we we have these rituals to become men but in america it's a different sort of myth that we're in the pursuit of um sorry in comparison to you said this is happening in america yeah in my, well against where else well i just think there's a there's a certain style of chauvinism that is perpetuated here in this country that involves um, violence, um, certain brand of violence, you know, um, a misogyny, you know, I, I don't, I, I shouldn't maybe compare it in that way, but, and that really, and those, those things are becoming more social political and I'm less interested in that, uh, that part of it, but mostly just for myself, still trying to understand like, what is this, what is this <coughs> ritual that, that you know we bring we continue to bring forward in in our culture not even in our culture just as just as men you know um yeah i i mean i recognize this work and i'll you know forgive the inhabitants for straying from this when we get there this as being you like chained to a post in your yard like you said like this is you know a uh, certain distance from your house and where you live, and this could potentially be seen as just you going to a place that you might naturally go to with this appendage, this instrument that is your camera with you. What is it? Like, obviously, you've had a certain degree of recognition. What is it that you think this stirs in other people? I can't. I can't know that. You know, I can only know what it stirs in me. Um, and tr I mean, I have to trust that my job is to pay attention and to, and to cultivate empathy. I think, I think of those as my two like primary objectives. If I have a, if I have a job, <laughs> that's my job, pay attention and, and try to cultivate empathy. Now, this work has, you know, you can call it a subject or not call it a subject, but there are humans in the frame and there is something that is tender and perhaps empathetic in the caption of those humans. A lot of the other work stirs some nostalgia or empathy without having any humans there. Um, mm -hmm. Is that how those images make you feel? Is that what you would say some of the images of twisted roots or um, like disfigured rebar? Yeah. You're, when you're saying, is that how it, what do you, what are you referring to? I'm saying is that how the image, when you, when you saw it, uh -huh. when the thing stirred in your own belly yeah. and you were like, it, I'm going to pull the camera to my face. Yeah. What is the thing that you feel? What is the thing that you feel? Um, it's very particular to that moment. There's a, there's an experience I'm having internally for whatever reason, if I'm, 
if I'm here, if I'm, if I'm in the cat skills, I mean, there's so much, you know, sensory that's stimulating something internal in me that then I'm connecting with in a form that exists in the world. So for any reason, like at that time, this inner thing meets this, this form in the world and a relationship is made by way of a picture. But still, that doesn't mean that when I eventually start editing and sequence and then possibly sequencing the work that is still going to hold that that's a subjective experience. And so it has to, the image, the picture has to defy the subjective experience of that moment where like not only what's happening in here in the form, but also the smell, the sound, like everything that defy, or defy. defy. Yeah. Like there's, there's so many other visceral things that are going on that our camera can't record because we don't have sound. We don't, we're not, we're not time-based like, like film, you know? So um, we don't have smell, you know? So those things can enter into the making of the picture, but they don't oftentimes allow the picture to remain once, once I'm editing or sequencing a body of work. Um, so that, that would be the last picture. I wanted to, just, I, I included this, this is um, a picture. I just had some images or a few prints in Perifoto and, just wanted to show you how going from the book to the exhibition, these are these images are printed in the dark room on an ortho orthochromatic film. Um, that is then, so these are 20 by 24 inches. And they're so they're printed on film from a digital negative that I contact print in the dark room, develop stop fix. And then they're sprayed with an enamel with a spray paint on the back side of them and they're suspended they're able to float and so that's where the material in this case the material is informing the form um and it's one way that i found to represent sort of a, a viscosity or a liquidity that i felt like expressed the, the picture this the, this series of pictures in the way that i wanted to are you saying Am I, I'm sorry. Are you saying I found an adequate form of representation? Not adequate, just uh, appropriate for the time. Like one, okay. one that felt, uh, again, it's about resonance. Like this, this is what I want this, you know, this is an expression of an image and this is how I want to express this picture. Because I'm a bit confused because before you said the book is the light. It is for me. I mean, that's the, but you know, when there is the time to do an exhibition, there have been bodies of work. Like I haven't exhibited much of Cyprian Honey Cathedral because there aren't many pictures from that body of work that to me seem to hold up on the wall the way that they do in a book. I've done, I've done a few small exhibitions of that work. Um, but I would say that those pictures for me work less on the wall than they do in the book form. Um, so if y'all have, it's starting to make sense. It, but not all of it makes sense to me. So, um, I mean, it's all. No, but I'm starting to understand you. That's what I'm please, <laughs> please, please tell me when you're when you've got it. <laughs> um, so, this is work from the inhabitants, and there is some text that I've left. The text was written by George Weld. Um, this work came about. I was um, I was nominated for an award that Hermes um, and Cartier-Bresson and ICP award every two years. They award one French photographer uh, a fellowship to come to America and photograph based on a proposal, and then one American photographer to go to France. Um, I set my proposal in Calais in France. So that was the only contingency was that it had to be photographed in France. And you had to follow a proposal of your work along with the portfolio. Um, and uh, I centered my work in France as a backdrop of the refugee crisis. Um, the proposal that I wrote, I would say probably 80% of it fell away once I got there and started making pictures, maybe 70% of it. Um, and I ended up photographing on the southern border of France with Spain and the northern border in Calais on the English Channel. And these became, for me, um, the borderlands where 
refugees were entering France to eventually get to the United Kingdom, crossing the English Channel. But it became, because I arrived in France, uh, in Southern France, again, like it's, where do you set down the camera? You know, I mean, like, how do I begin to create the constraints that allow me to take this wide country, this wide subject, and make it as, as narrow as I can? I want to be like placed in a corner and do a turn and like just start to find my way from there. So for me, it was looking for, I, I inherently looked for places that felt like home, and that was Ohio for me. And I found sycamore trees and I found a river that felt like Ohio and I start there, I anchor there. This is a place I know, I understand the visual language of this place and I can work here. And then I start working out from there and I start making pictures that then are informed by that place in particular. This is Southern France. And um, let's just look at some pictures and then hopefully there'll be some questions or I can talk about it in more elaborate hopefully articulate ways. The opening sentence that George uh, Weld, well, he wrote many sentences. We chose this one as the opening sentence for the body of work. Um, a word on a slate written in chalk, chalked wipe, wiped clean with a rag, a slate on a wall hung by a wire, um, which to me is uh, just the most transcendent sentence I can think of for this body of work that I'm going to show you. It just it's just so full of possibility and uncertainty and and really representative of, I think, the place a lot of um, refugees would find themselves. Again, I'm not thinking about politics or I'm not thinking about um, the current, you know, refugee crisis. I'm thinking of something more existential, more universal, um, what it is to be unseen, to feel unseen in the world, unheard, uh, to feel unmoored, um, something that I'm trying to make a body of work that is set in a specific place at a specific time, but that transcends that. I picked it up and cupped it in my hands and the small crowd gathered to watch and offer advice I could feel the bird twitching its feathers against my skin. I braced myself against the pinpricks of its talons. After a minute or two, it seemed to recover its senses and with no warning, it flew off. Everyone who gathered cheered. You have a magic touch, they said, your healing hands. A cook's hands, a sculptor's hands, a thief's hands, a mother's hands. I won't read all of this. Grayed? Gray, the color gray. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like it's an aesthetic choice that you've developed over your career. Is there something, I mean, do you see it as a, as a difference or do you see it, um, is that an aesthetic choice for you? It's, I mean, it is, it's always an aesthetic choice, but it's also one that um, just feels consistent with how I feel, I guess, you know, like I, it's a, I guess it's, these are black and white pictures, but if it were color, we'd be talking about a palette and we're talking about tonality. And um, yeah, I used to like a lot darker picture, you know, but I felt after a while, I just felt like dark, like evil. I mean, I'm not comparing dark with evil, but like evil, like it's easy, you know, like make a picture dark and it somehow becomes, it becomes, I don't know, it's like cheating for me in a way. Um, so I've, over the years, I've, I've, I'm printing much lighter, but I still prefer a full range and I prefer the grays. The other thing you just said is interesting is you said something like, that's what I feel. Uh -huh. And you've talked about form and you've talked about empathy, but I feel like that's the other major part of these texts. I don't hear you talk about emotional feeling it's got to all be about feeling for me you know like it's all about uh, feeling it's all about like what it generates like what the energy that's generated by pictures you know like it's a it's a i mean george saunders a writer describes it 
very simply, like, you know, you're paying attention to the needle. <laughs> the needle does this, you know, like, you know, it's, it's, you've connected with it. And when it's doing this, it's just paying attention to the needle. And I can only do that for myself and hope that it resonates or that it expresses something that, you know, is received beyond me. Yeah. So you spoke about how you're, you tend to, to focus on close to home. Um, it's a priority for the work that you do. Yeah. Today. So I'm curious what inspired you to want to go someplace else. And then also what the impact of working in this new space was for you, both as, as a photographer and as an artist. Yeah. I, I'm... I was when I was applying for this award I got I was really close to the deadline and I and it just occurred to me like I don't even want to go to France <laughs> to photograph I mean I'm 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 still fascinated by by this corner of the world you know and I'm and I think of myself as an American photographer I mean I love I'm not you know patriotic necessarily I just I love this country it's I love its geography I love its topography I love its diversity and I'm fascinated by it, the landscape here, the places. Um, and it's also, it's also become my focus and my, my love. So, but when I had this invitation, I mean, the thing that I had, a, I had a very tight deadline and I just needed to try to work this way. I needed to see what I could do with it. I needed a challenge of it. Um, and I, and like I said, the, the first thing I could do was try to, try to find a sense of home there, like try to feel at home in this place. Um, and I relied heavily on nature for that. And I relied heavily on walking in the beginning to sort of set the pace of patience and observing and paying attention. Cause like everybody, like a lot of other people in the, in the world right now, I'm, I'm mighty distracted by social media, by phones, by screens. So like setting the rhythm of, being in a place, observing, being patient, paying attention. Like that was all a practice that I had to, I had to relearn going there. Um, did that fully answer or? I guess I'm curious about, you know, what you took away from it going forward and how, how does that impact your art practice going forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, some of it was also just a resignation of saying yes, like this opportunity presented itself so say yes, go do it. Trust that there's, it's part of an evolution of some kind. Like there's something, this has something to show you. Um, so in that way, it allowed me to be a little less controlling in terms of choosing the place. Like sometimes you just go based on an invitation or you just go because that's where you're set down. Um, and then trust that. I mean, I like, I like to think that in terms of like, I went there to make portraits and I ended up not doing portraits at all. Um, I gave myself permission to do portraits in the sense that I think that nothing that is human should be alien to me. I should be able to do it as long as I've developed the necessary empathy and I've, and I've studied and I've, you know, I've done the, I've done whatever sort of background research I need to do. Um, but when I got there, and I started working um, closely with an organization called Care for Calais that provides services to refugees. And I got to know refugees um, and hear their stories. I just recited, I, we don't, I didn't need to make pictures, portraits of refugees um, and that it, I couldn't do it without feeling like I was exploiting them in some way. And I also like the challenge of um, invoking that, their presence in the landscape by way of and have their stories inhabiting me, me making pictures in the in the places where they might have passed. So this was a whole different way of working uh, entirely because a photo book, like the prescribed form of the photo book, would normally in this type of subject would include portraits of people. You know, we're sort of tasked with giving an overview, a comprehensive feel of the place. You know, so it's landscapes, it's atmosphere, it's close-ups, it's portraits, it's like we went the whole thing. But in this case, the writing, George's writing and George's empathy and bringing an imagined voice to the work, one that was universal and inclusive, um, did that 
in a way that I couldn't have done with a camera, I think. <laughs> From the beginning, we were already thinking of it as something that would end. We were imagining the way we'd look back on it. I love to listen to the sounds of people speaking, the water, uh, the unarticulated flow of their speech, words neither beginning nor ending, just one long form of molten language. I could imagine it to mean anything, almost anything. Phrases of music, passages of speech, words that seem to become patterns, repeating rhythms or associations, a motif, an aria, an erratic, unexpected protrusion. I was reduced to gesture, sound and improvisation of my body a desperate game of charades. Imagine not being able to speak or speaking but your words appearing in the air before you as nothing but lying twisted into ornate and useless knots. Inarticulate, frozen at the joints. The hunger for meaning deforms everything. First water, then land, first darkness, then light, breath into human form, breath into voice, breath into song, void into form, place out of no place. I recognize you. What did you see? It was dark. I saw nothing. I knew they were there only because I felt them. The way you almost see with your skin, the way space takes shape around you in the dark, the way you feel an opening on to one side, a wall close by the other, a kind of muffling of sensation, a feeling of depth, how else to describe it? A wheat paste flyer, a name inked on a wall, scratched in glass, a note left behind, tucked in a crevice, instructions or warnings or solicitations or boast, painted on rocks, on bridges, on alley walls, <coughs> the forms of hope, ancient and well-worn. How should we let them know we were here? A satellite watches from cold space. A helicopter strafes the hills with its beam. Dog sniffs the Dogs sniff the fence line, seeing what they smell, an explosion of color and information. All night, I wait and watch. My eyes play tricks on me. I can always say what I'm seeing. I can't always say what I'm seeing. If it's a cluster of bodies moving in the shadows or a throbbing capillary deep in my eye, the effect's the same. It looks like the dark is breathing. A third possibility, the dark itself is sentient, some part of it. There's a hole in the middle of the night where time itself disappears, bends, comes out garbled or meaningless. Landscape and body conflate as though we sleep in the arms of a hillside or rolling down the, ho the hollow of a hip bone, roll laughing down the hollow of a hip bone. Um, Greg, did you shoot all these on one camera? Yeah, I shot everything digitally on a um, Fuji. On a, on a medium format? Medium format, yeah, with uh, manual lenses, Pentax manual lenses. Night creeps in from behind us as we watch the cliffs across the water. The dunes we sit in cooling everywhere but beneath us, the water foaming against the sand before us, an almost electric nervousness where our elbows almost touch. I can say that color here in this part of the book, the choice for color um, was kind of serving two purposes for me. It was it, in one way, because this is more or less the halfway point of the book, you're not seeing the whole book, um, was to provide a release, was to provide a pause and a break, um, but also hopefully some levity, like color to me is so seductive. And 
it expresses something emotionally that black and white can't do necessarily, especially with these pictures of the water with sunlight. So it was sort of to like to open up for a moment before we go back in. How does it end? It empties into the sea, a torrent opens up and goes quiet. I prayed into the bowl of my hands and my words pulled there like something to pour over a sunburned neck, to darken a patch of bone dry so soil, to stiffen the stalk of a drooping leaf to wet a parched tongue and free it to speak. Laughter in the weeds, three men grilling fish they caught eating it from the fire with their hands, an open palm spread wide in invitation. At night, I look into the sky and wish for it to come closer. Even a single branch crossing my view has the effect of an embrace, something to hold me in place to keep me from floating off into the depths of night. I lie on my back and try to count, count stars the river rushing down the hill, gorged on snowmelt, gives emotion to the sky so that even though I know the stars move only a thumb span every few minutes, it feels as though they're cut loose, as though they're swirling around the bowl of the sky like marbles. The earth simmering below the surface, seething, waiting patiently, holding us on its skin, the way as a child you let your brother lay rows of coins across your back, your bare back. Lay still, I will cover you like a fish in scales. And you felt the coins cool on your skin and the dry ends of his fingertips and heard the steady, focused breathing. And when you inhaled, you felt the coins expand as one. A jointed shell, the space between them opening and closing as you slowly let the air out of your lungs, trying not to cough. How do you know it's time? The weather changes, the moon moves, the birds come back or leave, a star you haven't seen in months appears again just above the tree line. A memory recurs, some mark deep in your body means that when the seasons click around to this point again, you remember something that you'd laid to rest long ago. You can't live here anymore. Cicadas husk, coca lith marks the body leaves marks the body leaves behind, soft tissue, rots, bones grow brittle, you turn to chalk. We remember this story by making it into a song. A sailor's hands, a priest's hands, a builder's hands, a suppliant's hands. When I left home, I was an orphan. When I worked in the scrapyard, I was a salvage worker. When I cleared the table, I was at your service. When I fell to my knees, I was a man of God. When I ran at the chance, I was reduced to my instincts. When I carried a child on my back, I was beloved, I was strength. When I sang in the night, I was a song. When the searchlights being pinioned me to the fence, I was a bird in a net. When I hid in the shadow, I was shadow myself, hoping the sun would leave me be and the moon not shine too bright.
I need to be seen to know I am real. I need to stay out of sight. They are looking for me. They avert their eyes. How much of the editing process of this was happening before the text? Like, were you working with these images without the text in mind for mm-hmm. a while, and then? Yeah, we George George would come. George lives in Rhinebeck, and um, he would come across the bridge, and we would just look at pictures. He didn't, he was writing and researching for six months. And finally with about a month, maybe a month and a half before I had to, we had to submit everything to the publisher. He started presenting text. So when you were shooting, it was completely. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Just making pictures and amassing an archive um, that we could then start to sort through when I got back. And then at a certain point it was, it was combining image and text, trying to figure out where they fit, you know, and then organizing it, not in a sequential way, but in a way that felt like it was a story, but not a story, you know. And was any of his text, uh, you know, influenced by the pictures or was it all done kind of Norwegian? That'd be a question for George, I think. Um, that'd be a question for George to answer. We, I mean, our, the, the goal that we had with the, with, um, this collaboration was that the images would not exist really on their own and neither would his words. Like they, we wanted to form a reliance, a co-reliance on image and text for this body of work. Um, And so that also meant that there couldn't be heroic images, you know, like the images all had to sort of maintain, I mean, my, my, my wish for the the pictures was what, that they would take a background to George's writing because I, I'd love the writing so much. And his wish was that the opposite, that my pictures would, you know, so we entered with this sort of generosity and appreciation for each other and what we had done. So at a certain point, like we needed, we needed uh, the publisher to come in and say like, no, you guys, you know, bring it, you know, bring everything you got. And, um, but I I think it strikes a pretty good balance still if um, neither one of them, like the images there aren't, the images are relying on an accumulation and on, on a steady, movement of pictures to, to do their work. Did you influence George's writing by telling you the stories that you heard from like refugees or not not too many. There weren't there weren't many I could even remember to share. Um I mean there were a few, but m- most of it, I mean he researched borders and refugees and immigration around the world. So you know it wasn't based on a specific geographical area or this part of uh, Europe. He was researching, you know, Latin America um, and, and, you know, Homer's Odyssey. Like he was, it was a timeless, it's a timeless subject. If there is a subject. This is beautiful. I have to read this one. If there are ghosts, they are woven into the soil like mycelia, like water channeling through the strata. They hold the place together and might yet pull it apart. How dull to imagine they would take human form, that a spirit freed from the body would yet hold the body's shape. Their boundaries dissolve. They intertwine, a perfect stranger to you, and life is wound together with you after. I'm not sure what I did, Sarah. The way time marks itself on the body. Your wound has healed, your hair's grown long, you've lost weight, your eyes have sunk into their sockets. The map your palm predicted is overwritten with scars. In fact, in what might be a palm set, a slate wipe not clean, but clean enough. The pain exercised as trace remains. I carried seeds with me, sewn into the hem of my jacket. You can fit your body into this hollow like you were pulled from it at birth, like the theory of the continents drifting apart. Don't we all want to go back to where we came from, curl into that shelter, that cove, that place where the land wraps around us like a cupped palm?
The language you left on the ground, the words you put in my mouth, I held them between my teeth and my cheeks. Last two pictures. Blistered asphalt and long, low buildings and thickets of road signs and tangles of wire and the endless river of cars and buses and trucks, the parking lots and medical services and drive throughs and the gangs of dumpsters lined up behind the grocery store and the stacks of pallets and the banners and flags and pennants fluttering along the side of the roads and the cement cylinders filled with pansies and bulwarks and curb cuts and traffic islands, the road paint and flashing lights and quietly humming lights and lights roving the ground in endless circles or tunneling up through the night sky over a used car lot. Do you notice the smell and fall of the earth where creeks might have run or might run yet? How did I learn to love this place? I brought your language back to you. And um, I just wanted to, again, like talking about just briefly about um, like moving from book to exhibition um, with, with the enormous shout out to CPW for offering me a space to work for much longer than, than I promised. Um, and uh, the way that, the way that material matter informs form the way that I think I, I read somewhere once that like, um, in order for a, a man to to construct a house, he needs to build his own tools. And <clears throat> I went into my attic. I mean, I this 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 fellowship was sponsored by Hermes, and I had pretty much unlimited resources to make the exhibition I wanted to make in terms of prints, uh, the types of prints I wanted to make, framing. Like I could do just about anything. Um, but that sort of freedom felt like felt um, terrifying to me. Um, and because I, it's just, again, it's like, it's too big. Like I need to make this, I need constraints. I need to make this small. And I went into my attic to look, uh, we, um, my partner, Adrian and all, she helped me make, um, 14 books, um, that were on display. And while up there looking for paper, I found all this other paper that I've been accumulating. And I just thought like, this is my constraint. I don't need to buy any materials for this exhibition. I have everything here how do I use what I have here to make the exhibition I wanted? So these larger prints were made out of, um, that's a nine panel uh, printed on book paper, mounted to masonite. I ended up constructing frames for the work. It's just like, I got to a certain point and I felt like I needed to keep, I wanted to have the experience of assembling the work and I wanted to have the time with the work so that I could continue to understand the work and and continue the dialogue between me the maker and the objects i was making we put up a ledge where there are prints and objects these are fire grates that i had brought back from calais they would have been at abandoned um, settlement camps. So you put the objects on top of the photographs or intertwine them in the photographs? Yeah, and in some cases I had actually photographed them. Might have a picture here. Yeah, this is another fire grate. Um, and I actually, had, I had made pictures of, of the grates also um, as they existed in the world, or we did it back. I did made them back here in New York and some of those pictures ended up as well. That's it. Thank you. Any other questions, or do we? So many. <laughs> did we answer them all? Uh, um, I know you've talked about. I've heard you speak about the exhibition being something different from the book. Um, could you talk about that just a little bit? As it, as, it be, as it living and breathing is something different than what the experience of the book would be. Yeah. 
Well, I've, I've been trying to bring those two closer together in exhibitions. It's diff like in a, in a non-for-profit or a museum space, it's easier to do um, because uh, it's not a gallerist and their real estate <laughs> um, involved. You know, when they put, when a gallery puts something on the wall, they're putting it up there because they, they want to try to sell it. So in trying to make images that can live in, pro in close proximity with each other and inform each other the way a book would, means that they're going to like people want to when they're looking at buying an image they want to buy a print a single image um i'm just making pictures now that don't do that i don't i don't make many pictures that i think can live on their own and so my impulse is if i'm doing if i'm doing a gallery exhibition is to try to incorporate like groupings of work but that means that, you know, you're not getting to pick out the one picture that you want to have necessarily. But I haven't, I mean, I've, I've, only, I've done very few shows since this commission. So, um, so I'm trying to bring those two things closer together, but that that's the challenge really is like, how do you, how do you, how do I work in a serial manner, working with accumulation of pictures to do, to convey, to create a contained world um, and do it in one picture, you know? I mean, there are photographers who do that and do it well. Um, it's just not the way I prefer to work. So they're yeah, they're two very different things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love. I personally love the idea of a book as an art object, um, and I definitely gravitate towards that. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your advice to somebody getting started in that space. Anything you could offer about your... about doing a book? About just just things that you wish you knew when you were starting to make books on your own. Uh, it's changed so much, you know. Um, what would be a specific question in that way, though? I don't know. I I mean, I'm in the process of trying to hand make a book and hand stitch, and mm -hmm. just trying to absorb as much information as possible. But I really want mm -hmm. the the object to be the art piece, not necessarily mm -hmm. just photographs. Yeah. That are in it. Yeah. I don't know. That's not really a specific <laughs> question either. So yeah. I apologize. No, I mean, I think, you know, I, you know, that it's hard to like, just when I started making books of any kind, uh, I was living in rural Montana. So like the immediacy of making was the most important thing. And that meant spending more time at the hardware store than the, art supply store because making was paramount and, you know, movement was paramount. Uh, archivability was not as important to me. Um, so, I mean, it's an expression. It's a, uh, you, you just have to like lower your head and like not pay attention to what anybody else is doing. Make books that are for you. I, I came across an artist, uh, James Castle, who was a autistic man. He was a giant man. He lived in Boise, Idaho. Um, and he would make these handmade books out of soot and spit as in sticks. Like he would, you know, spit, mix some soot with a, with a pointed stick. And he would do these drawings on books on match boxes. And he would sew them together and make books. And like, that was a revelation for me, you know, that a book is not a sum of uh, fine linen and, you know, uh, hundred percent cotton paper and, you know, archival glues, rice glues. Like it's, it can be that, but to make something beautiful out of common materials, um, became sort of where I wanted to exist in the making of books. This is much about, and then when you're making an object, it's like, what do you, what's the experience you want to have? Like, what's the book that you haven't seen, you know, that you want to have exist in the world and make that book. Would you consider your book, physical book, piece of art, a work of art? The um, I I wouldn't say that the that the trade edition books that I make with publishers would be that, but I think that what I make as a handmade book okay. tries to be that. I mean, I don't get to decide so much if it is a work of art, um, but. Well, conversely, would you consider George Saunders? His stories, his books. I also love him. Would you consider 
those to be a work of art? Big questions. Uh, I don't know that it's important. I mean, I don't know that that's an important distinction to, yeah. for any of us. I mean, I think working as a, I think, I think he's working as an artist. Uh, and I think working as an artist means that again, it's the same. Like, I think I could apply the same to uh, imperatives, you know, pay attention and cultivate empathy. I mean, I think that's what George Saunders does really well. He probably, those aren't probably his two, but just applying those two, I mean, those are two things I think that, those are two privileges that I have pursuing this life as an artist that um, that I don't take lightly. You know, I mean, that's, that's my job. Um, and it is a privilege, you know, not everybody gets to do it. I haven't had a job my entire life. I've been making pictures my entire life. I've never clocked in, <laughs> so. That's, you know, it's my time. Yeah, I, I'm in control of my time. So, could you? Yeah. Sorry. So you're talking about like the making of the book and, and you know, making your own things and whatnot. I'm curious, especially I know you worked with Michael Mack and, and with George, like where, what, where were the points where you felt like you had stretched as far as you could stretch and where did they meet you? I don't know if that's... Stretched how? Stretched? Uh, you know, um, in the making of the story, you know, I guess, how how complete did you feel you got this to be? And then where did they start to kind of, you know, yeah. reach out? And kind of yeah. Make? The publisher. Y yeah. Michael yeah. And they, they make it, they make it an object that can exist in the world. You know, like I, I just dream and mm -hmm. I, and I work according to a dream and then they, they make it into the object with, you know, the materials that a book publisher uses. And Max a great publisher for like wanting to try and experiment. Like we went in and, and printed on paper that, you know, had never been used before, which is 100% recycled, meant to feel like newsprint, you know, common materials. Um, but I had something I was going to say to that and I lost it. Um, it's not going to come back to me. I know it's not coming back. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking similarly about um, publishers' influence on the book, um, especially when you're including text, whose decision is it in terms of composition um, and sequencing to where where does the text um, who, who chooses what images the text goes with? Yeah, um, George and I got to choose ninety percent of that. Even if you weren't working in tech, yeah, we still got to, we, we put it together. I originally composed the text or had designed the text to work, to function as a caption, would function in a picture, like a textbook. Because otherwise we didn't want to have like a, a, a lumping of text at the beginning and or middle. We wanted it to be an experience that went through the book. But if the question is like, where do you put that text? You know, um, how does it not feel gratuitous or how does it not, you know? And so it felt like, you know, we're accustomed to, to reading captions that feel like they're important in terms of understanding place or the time they were taken, you know, the date, that kind of thing. Um, so to place them there, because that's a prescribed way of engaging with text in a picture, felt like the way that we wanted to work um, in, the, in the combining of text and image. Uh, and then aside from that, it's like, is it italic or is it, you know, is it serif, sans serif? Like what, what makes it lyrical in a way? What, you know, like what makes it pleasant to read? Because the, the text is important. On the other hand, like the text, I talked to a man at the opening at ICP. He said, I just got the book two days ago. I said, what do you think of it? He said, I'm, I'm a third of the way through it, you know? And it's like, that's when you have a photo book that, like, you don't hear I'm a third of the way through it. But that's frankly like the only kind of the only book I want to make anymore. Like I don't want to make a book that, I mean, we photographers who work in the book form are working in a nuanced language, but I don't know that the rest of the world is accessible. It's accessible to, like, I feel like most photographers, myself included, are making books for other photographers. How do we make books for, like, I'm interested in making like a 
like making pictures for a recipe book, you know, or like something that feels like a guide or something that feels useful, but bringing that aesthetic to that object in a way that like, you know, like we all know what to expect when we open a cookbook, those pictures, you know, but like, how do I, like, I, I'm not saying specifically a cookbook, but I want to make books that can do more than just be this um, sort of nuanced object, precious thing that, you know, we all are, have our books and we're also happy to have them. But like, I don't, I don't know, like there aren't, there are very few that I return to. seems like there's like a tactile process after like the way you're printing it and scraping the back of or the film like how does it go from the image to the book do you print them and then they photograph them is it have these just digital files that yeah they're all they're all digital files at the end I, I have a dream of like making prints my first book I did in 20 2005 with Nazareli press they were all prints and they photographed and uh I the darkroom process is still one that I rely heavily on for to bring chance back into it or to bring recovery and, you know, that process back into it is something I still long for. But with this many pictures and the timeline that we had, and the timeline was a blessing and a curse. I mean, the thing that, the thing that's always challenging about like having that close of a timeline is like, there's a certain point where if you have time, like if you don't have a deadline, you, the work can regain its autonomy. Like it can, like for a work to, for me, like for a work to be meaningful, it has to, you want the hand of the maker to somehow be erased or, or subverted. And that's a hard thing to do when you don't have, like, I don't want to see my hand in the making of it. It helps to have a collaborator who's a writer, helps to have a publisher and a designer, but I still, still the goal is to like give the book its autonomy, like give the object back its autonomy. I think most great works of art, there's a decreative process. There's like an erasure of the artist's hand in the work or the death of the author, right? Is So that's a hard thing to do. I mean, fortunately I had a few trusted critics and I had, like I said, I had George um, and a few other friends to weigh in on it. It's been such a journey to be here, <clears throat> to, to look at the work and hear you speak about it. I've seen the work before, but I kind of, excuse me very much, I don't mean to be rude, but I just missed it. And then I, because I didn't, I come from a more traditional classicist yeah. form, and when you said gray, that's exactly what I was thinking. And what's the point of focus, and where's the, the, the object, and where's the edges and where's where's the form he's talking about you know like all of that was going through me and I it's like I it's like I felt like a little was a little shoot coming up through the winter soil like as a flower when I got through this because first of all it felt to me so much like so many things were happening in my brain when I was start watching and listening like the text um uh, contributes so much to the work because really the work, I don't know how edited down it is or how selected it is, but it feels like to me, it's just someone wandering through the world or someone like wandering to the, at the, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, really there's, you know, not any human inhabitants you're wandering around. It's like after war, post-war. Yeah. And then you hear this very poetic writing. So it's like a voiceover of someone mm -hmm in their head, like what they're feeling and experiencing when you look at the work. But the work as photographs, I see what you mean about that still image on the wall. Like they needed that insulation that you created. Perfect, works beautifully. It's almost like the documentation of a land artist, actually. I was thinking very much about Smith and, Smith and when you see yeah. their work in the gallery, it's all about the land. Yeah. And this is all about the land also, in mm -hmm. so many ways. Yeah. And to put it in the way and to create the space around it and the relationships between photographs the way you did in the installation is just a remarkable piece of composition, hmm. you know, a form mm -hmm. in space. Yeah. 
everything that works so well. And it also what reminded me of, do you ever see this film of uh, Chris Marker from Hard Rock Bar and Jack Yeah. Okay, well, you know, this, there's still photographs. Yeah. And there's one frame where the eye moves. Mm. There's one frame of movement. And I thought about this work, it's like Chris Marker film. Yeah, somebody else brought that up once. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, and George looked at that film a lot while he was, for one of the films he looked at when he was writing. Yeah. 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 That's that's so beautiful. I'm just mesmerized. Like, yeah. I don't want you to stop. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> You see it right in the middle and dogs yeah. running around you and exactly. yeah. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it.